friends, <clears throat> I must acknowledge that it is easy to be optimistic. And I think if anything working for government teaches you is that you've got to be not only realistic, you almost have to be surrealistic. When we talk about the great growth volumes, the billionaires, and we also talk about poverty in the same breath, it seems that we are a land and society of complete contradictions. As a society, I do not think that we have acknowledged the essence of poverty. I also do not think that in 60 years, as a legal system, we have concerned ourselves with poverty. I also do not believe that we have adequately analyzed what exactly does poverty do in the long term in a democracy. We have treated the poor as objects of charity and aid. We do not treat the poor as equals entitled to constitutional rights and particularly access to justice. We are prepared to legitimate any abuse of power under the guise that it is done in public interest. We use the most ubiquitous phrases and we simply do not confront the total lack of empowerment which poverty does. When we discuss poverty and law, I think our focus must be on minimizing the causes of poverty through law. It is not a linear concept. It is not entirely unambiguous. And it is an approach which we must admit is based on comparativism. It is, after all, based on comparisons, which shows whether, in spite of being poor, you're able to advance justice, or whether there is a retreat of justice because of poverty. If there is a retreat of justice because of poverty, we should know that law has been subordinated to the claims of the poor. The various definitions of poverty which we have today include concepts which essentially refer to material status. They include need, they include material deprivation and lack of security as their main elements. Then there will be a definition which usually deals with the moral status of the poor, including their entitlement and hardships. I'm glad that poverty is a focus of discussion. As a result of the spectrum of various stakeholders, poverty has been approached from different perspectives. Of course, the World Bank conceptualizes poverty within the confines of economics, drawing a poverty line at below $2 per day. And we have economists like Rogers who have conceded that poverty is much more than about income levels. Now, one of the issues which I want to talk about is the multidimensional approach to poverty. And one of the dimensions by which you can overcome poverty is by successful empowerment. And empowerment can, in fact, be achieved through law, and more importantly, as I'm going to speak about, through what I believe is the legal empowerment program. The World Bank today employs a multi-dimensional social approach. It defines poverty based on gender, age, culture, social and economic factors. 
For the poor, poverty is not about income, but it is about the real world difficulties in securing food and livelihood caused by dependency and lack of power, lack of perception of power and a sense of defeat and lack of voice. The poor tend to attach much more importance by this reason to assets instead of actual empowerment. They don't believe in income as much as assets. Poverty must be seen in its total bareness. It is the lack of education. It is the lack of health care. It is the lack of nutrition. It is the lack of clean water. It is the lack of safe sanitation. It is the lack of income. And above all, it is the lack of accountability. And all this only leads to premature death. One of the fundamental reasons why I think that poverty reduction needs to be confronted by law is that law is the only instrument under the Constitution which can bring about a balance when you have imbalanced social structures, when you have shall we say, ineffective governance, when you have bias of the executive in dealing with citizenry, when you have minorities of whatever kind they be, when you have ethnic groups who might be subjected to, again, arbitrary fiat, it is all going to be constitutionalism which would ultimately protect the rights of the citizens. Now, this constitutionalism is the means by which you can empower poor people, and that's the first step in the reduction of poverty itself. Legal rules may be facially non-discriminatory, but we know that in application, they do produce results of complete social discrimination. They worsen poverty. They, in fact, claim to aim at poverty alleviation, but in fact, they force most people to live outside the protection of the opportunities permitted by the law. Human development gaps reflect unequal opportunity. Law can actually ensure equal opportunity. It can do so by incremental steps. And the extreme inequalities which we see in most societies are caused by structural forces which are again rooted in power structures which deprive people of market opportunity but more importantly deprive access to justice and deny them political voice. These gaps reinforce and recycle extreme poverty and are frequently maintained by the law. Therefore, I want you to consider that law has a direct relationship with poverty maintenance and unless law becomes an effective instrument and when it becomes effective you will find that the imbalance is slowly getting focused and there would be a better equilibrium. The law is not meant to be used as a defensive mechanism. In our society we look at law as a cloak as a car cover, we never look at it as a means by which normative conduct in civil society has to be maintained. The non-enforcement of the law for the protection of the poor builds on the existing status quo. Nevertheless, I believe that law can serve as a powerful tool by making legal rights effective reversing deprivation of capabilities. What is lacking is a bottom-up approach, which is often more complex because we have issues which are linked to law, politics, as well as society. Empowerment through the law, or legal empowerment for the poor, LEP, is a process through which people and communities increase their control, 